Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Alex Curse Project. This is the first ever panel for the Alex Curse Project, and I want to take the time to thank everybody that's going to be tuning in tonight or people are going to be watching in the future. So, this being the very first panel that I'm going to host for the Alex Curse Project, the first topic I wanted to talk about was the withdrawal from Afghanistan, okay? But before we go actually into the topic of it, we're going to go ahead and introduce your panelists, including myself. Uh, you've got myself, the Alex Kirsch, from the Alex Kirsch Project. You can also catch my podcast, Depth of Perspective, on Spotify. You can also catch it on Audible and here on YouTube. All right. You've also got Radical Coder here. You've got Michael Hilliard, and you've got Manny to the Max. So, uh, Radical, go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Ryan, or Radical Coder. Um, I'm a computer scientist and uh, computer science and math tutor. Um, I am not a foreign policy expert, and I am very, very underqualified to be here, but I consider myself a professional learner, and I'm generally pretty good at engaging with, um, uh, inf like, digesting and uh, engaging with information in real time, so it's, uh, it's very fascinating for me to fill in gaps in my knowledge. I've been investigating a lot of this topic. I, again, I know I, I'm, I'm here to learn more than anything, and uh, I, guess, I guess poke questions where, where I feel they, they should be. All right. Michael, go ahead. My name is Michael Hilliard. I'm the host of the Red Line podcast, a geopolitical podcast uh, for, with experts from the White House, the CIA, Oxford, Harvard, and Cambridge talking about geopolitical issues. I'm also the communications director for the Oxford Society of Central Asian Affairs, uh, a DC-based think tank focusing uh, mostly on the stans of the former Soviet, Repu Soviet, uh, Soviet Union, as well as Afghanistan. Uh, so obviously my perspective on this will be very much from uh, Afghanistan and the effects it will have on the Central Asian region. Uh, I've also, you know, been published by NATO and a, a geopolitical writer for many years now. Excellent. Uh, Manny, go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Hello, I'm Manny to the max. Um, I am pretty much just a guy who surfs the internet and uh, I was invited on by Alex to come talk about uh, what's going on in Afghanistan right now. And I'm ex definitely excited to be here. I am not a professional in foreign affairs, but I will give my as honest of an opinion as I can. And right. I can be reached on Discord at Manny to the Max. All right, fantastic. So once again, I want to take the time to thank everybody that uh, could be here. And for those that couldn't make it, you know, I get it. You know, life happens. It's not the end of the world. So, all right. So anyway, all right. So as we look at it, here's the situation as of right now for the situation in uh, Afghanistan, right? So first things first. I remember where I was when former President Bush declared war on the country of Afghanistan. I was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma for basic training. September 11, 2001 was my fourth day of basic training. And on the 16th of September, 2001, President Bush had declared war on terrorism. Since then, there have been four presidents. $2.4 trillion has been spent, that's in, as of 2020, with interest. There have been 2,312 U.S. military service members that have been killed in action. However, when it comes down to the Afghan civilian ca or Afghan casualties, there have been 241,000 Afghan killed in Afghanistan, with 71,000 of them being civilians. I never went to Afghanistan myself until 2010, which was my last deployment in the army. Afghanistan is a country that has been invaded by a great number of empires and military campaigns to include Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, the Persian Empire, the British Empire, and the Soviet Union. We helped fund the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets, and that campaign was very bloody for the Soviets. Since then, the Taliban has completely had control of Afghanistan from 1996 until the U.S. invaded in 2001. Now that the U.S. is withdrawing from Afghanistan, the Taliban has officially reclaimed 85% of its original territory. Taliban forces have seized weapons and vehicles from the Afghan military. Afghan commandos have been, kept, have been captured and executed by the Taliban, and right now, Countries like China, who was a huge critic of the U.S. invasion, is now worried about the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Other countries have their own concerns. Many across the world think it's time to leave Afghanistan to their own devices. Others have concerns that the Taliban are going to use this as a recruiting tool to rally believers to their cause, and they would, could very well spread outside of the borders of Afghanistan. So now we will go around and everyone will get their thoughts on this. So everybody, you'll give like about, for initial opening statements on this, I'll ask to uh, go no longer than uh, five minutes. I'll keep uh, track of this these times. But uh, so Michael, you are one of our foreign policy guys. So go right ahead. So the situation in Afghanistan is, is not great, but frankly, it's, it's 
the cards that we're playing at the moment. So the Taliban are contesting a lot of territory at the moment, but most of the territory they take is the low hanging fruit. So all the areas that had very little government control by now anyway, uh, effectively over the Trump administration, the uh, most of the ANA had pulled back to very safe to defend areas. Yeah. Uh, so effectively all the low hanging fruits already gone and they're taking more territory as we speak. Uh, what we're seeing is the Taliban starting to move into an administration role. So they're already starting to contact the US about things like how to pay you bureaucrats, how to run dams, how to get the systems all running in the, in, in the country, which is good. It means the Taliban are effectively looking to be taking administrative control of some of the areas of Afghanistan. Uh, what this is problematic for is, is will the US be happy with the Taliban taking full control of the country? So right now, there's sort of three scenarios we were worried with that we are up on our radar at the moment. One is what happened when the Soviets left, which is effectively when the Soviets left uh, Afghanistan in the 80s, the actual Kabul government, the communist government of Afghanistan actually held for quite a while. It only stopped functioning when the Soviet Union broke down and started stopped sending money to Afghanistan. Yes, the communist government had very little control over areas in the South and, and the West particularly, uh, but Kabul still functioned as a puppet Russian state. Uh, so they could, they, you know, the guy that would go to the UN on behalf of Afghanistan was a Russian puppet. And this is kind of what I think the US are hoping for. Scenario two is a Mosul scenario that effectively, as soon as the US leave, uh, the, the Afghan forces will start to dissolve. Uh, and we've seen quite a lot of defections over the last three weeks, particularly by the Tajik, ethnic Tajik soldiers who are fleeing into Tajikistan as we speak. Um, that's possible. Although I think it doesn't give the ANA enough credit because some of the ANA are doing quite well and they are willing to defend their own territory. Uh, as it is, when the Taliban was in control, you know, they still never controlled the whole country, particularly by some of the ethnic Tajiks uh, did not like the Taliban. Uh, that's why the Northern Alliances particularly were made up of Tajiks and Uzbeks who were willing to fight, uh, fight against the Taliban in 2001. Uh, the other scenario was a Saigon scenario, the famous helicopters leaving Saigon as the city falls. I don't think the Taliban have the strength at the moment to be able to make a full push uh, at, at Kabul uh, because frankly, that'll be absolutely costly and the US will provide air support. So the US is shopping around at the moment, trying to find bases to place in other places. So that would be uh, nations like Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kurd, uh, Turkmenistan uh, to effectively provide air support for the Kabul government. Uh, and they will likely keep the money flowing in at air support. That might be enough to stave off any Taliban attack because it would be incredibly bloody to go take to Kabul. Um, but the, the, I think it would be one of the three scenarios. It might be in the middle. I don't think the Taliban have the strength at the moment to fight real heavy, fine battles, but they also don't want to at the moment. Um, right now, the US are still on the ground and do have a free hand to strike back if they required that. Um, but the Taliban also know that why would they waste the troops now when they can just wait, what, two months and then they're fighting just the ANA rather than fighting the US, uh, US forces. There will be a lot of private military guys on the ground protecting major airports, highways, and cities. Uh, we don't know. There has been talk by the Biden administration to leave 650 troops to guard the US embassy as well as the Kabul airport, because that will be incredibly crucial uh, to supplying if we need it. But your major air bases like, you know, uh, already being evacuated, the US are effectively only there in name at the moment. Um, and a lot of diplomats are being pulled up. Um, as much as the Taliban on one hand are you know, the Taliban haven't been buying ammunition for years now because they've been capturing so much of the US's. So they are taking ground, they are doing well, they are contesting about 80% of the, of the terror of the, uh, you know, the divisions of Afghanistan, but they are the low hanging fruit. They are the easy bits, the bits the US had barely any control of. And most of these battles are uncontested at the moment, particularly the areas around the Turkmenistan border. Uh, you know, the Taliban rock up and all the ANA guys hand over the weapons and leave, or they leave, or they're demoralized. I think the the saying that it continuously comes up when you talk, because I, I spent some time with the Taliban in Uzbekistan, and the saying that continuously comes up at the moment is, um, you, you know, they have the watches, but we have the time. 30 seconds. Uh, yeah. And that's where, I, that's where I will probably leave it is, they have the watches, but we have the time, because the Taliban know that the US will leave. And they know that it's, particularly with the midterms coming up, it will be political suicide to go back in. They'll wait for the US to leave and capture a lot of the territory. Uh, whether they go for Kabul, though, is still a question. I think we probably might look at the Soviet scenario as a way going forward. All right, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for your opening statement. Uh, Matty, you can go ahead and go next right now. Okay. Um, 
pretty much um, how I look at the whole situation uh, in Afghanistan right now. I am uh, all for us leaving Afghanistan. I think it should be a slow approach. I don't think it would be smart to just hurry up and rush out. I definitely think um, it should be done uh, with uh, with some sort of baby steps involved. Um, I do definitely agree with what Michael said as far as if we have to leave troops to protect the embassies and certain things like that. That I can understand for obvious reasons. Um, however, we've been there for you know for many years. I mean, we've been there since I think I was in like the fourth or fifth grade. So we've been there for a good portion of my, my life. And I, I look at it as at a certain point, um, other countries have to be able to eventually stand on their own two feet and be able to protect what's theirs. Um, I think that we can only do so much. And I do understand uh, the United States, we do have a certain amount of fault to play uh, as far as certain bad things that have happened in Afghanistan. Um, however, with that being said, um, once we get off of that, I think there's still a lot of, uh, a lot that uh, the Afghan government needs to, uh, to step up and accomplish uh, for themselves. And um, that's uh, pretty much my opening. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ryan, go ahead and give your opening statement, please. Sure. So um, I guess the way that I'm going to approach this is probably like try to convey my my current understanding of everything and various sides that I've like seen it uh, discussed through. And uh, I guess uh, if I if I say anything wrong, make sure or please, please let me know or correct. Me. I, I'm not here to spread any sort of misinformation. Gotcha. Um, so I, I guess like my uh, my general understanding is that um, uh, I mean, Michael kind of did a, a really good preliminary there uh, that uh, showed me. I actually did uh, digest a lot of what I've been binging the past few days. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I guess the situation is is extremely complicated. Obviously, um, we, one of the it seems like uh, it's almost a a joke to like uh, maybe a meme among. Um, uh, various militaries about how invading Afghanistan is a bad idea, or this has been a thing before, uh, before the U.S. ended up there. And um, like the whole, <laughs> ever since we've been there, um, uh, it, we, we obviously have been uh, helpful in many ways and, and harmful in a lot of ways. Uh, and the fact that we're still there is contentious for a lot of people who are I mean, there's obviously a lot of people who just want all of the troops to come back. They think the U.S. shouldn't be interfering anywhere, shouldn't be sending troops anywhere. Um, and then there's people who think that we should be sending troops wherever there are uh, dictatorial regimes or anything that um, uh, anything like the uh, what I would say. I mean, the far like the Taliban is uh, very, very scary, especially if you're a woman. Um, I, I would be very, very, it's very sad to imagine. Um, I, I've, I know Joe Biden mentioned a, a woman he uh, heard or talked to um, who was like, I, I want to be a doctor if, 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 they, if the US leader, or if the Taliban takes it, like, I, I won't be able to be a doctor. And that, that kind of stuff, like, really is, it really, I think, drives uh, home my biggest concern about this, which is uh, the, the people of Afghanistan. And I, what I want to know at the end of the day is what do they want? Um, and what can the U.S. do to support that? Um, because I, I'm generally, at the end of the day, I'm a big fan of democracy. That's all, always my main goal. Um, and I, I suspect that most of the people in Afghanistan don't want to be under Taliban rule. Um, <laughs> I, I've heard, I, I, I mean, I've heard that oh, kind of reductively described as uh, they're the bad guys. But I think that I, like that's, that is what it is. Um, maybe I, I don't I'm, I, like they're the bad guys and, and we're the good guys in a way. But I think that framing things that way is kind of dangerous. So I, I tend to steer away from language like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know exactly what uh, it, it seems like we're, we're it, it, maybe it looks I think from the outside um, for the layman for a layman like me, it seems like we're, we're pulling out without um, it doesn't it doesn't feel like there's much of a a plan for moving forward. My, I, I, I guess it, it kind of, it, it's, it kind of concerns me. And so I'm, uh, I mean, I guess it concerns everyone. 
Um, and I, that's that's uh, my my that's my opening statement. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah. So before I open up the floor to everybody, so I'm gonna give uh, my assessment about it. So it's a double-edged sword. It's a damned if you do, damned if you moment kind of deal for the United States. You're damned if you stay there, but you're damned if you pull out too soon. When it comes down to the situation of Afghanistan, there's a lot of contributing factors into us leaving. There are people out there that say, well, we should have pulled out a long time ago, but we didn't really have much of an exit strategy at the point. You can ar People can argue the point as to whether we should have been there in the first place. You can do that all day long. But the fact of the matter is we were there, right? Um, there was a huge problem as far as corruption, uh, differences in coastal cultures and customs between tribes. You've got ANA and Afghan police that were kind of at odds with one another because of cultural differences but that's why uh for the longest time you know uh, spec ops has been working as advisors but then joint chief of staff general milley developed the uh SVABs. SVAB stands for security force assistance brigade which is based out of you know down here in georgia and what they do is they're supposed to be able to go to different countries and help advise and give the um governors or the government or the military some credibility and the reason why this is a good thing is because i remember when i was in iraq in 2008 i worked advising the iraqi military and but the problem was is that we would be going out for two hours of patrol then we would train them for two hours but then we got to go finish our two hour uh, the rest of our six hour patrol and by then you're already exhausted the purpose of these SFABs is to ensure that they their only main focus is to make sure that the people they are working with, that's their only job, to make sure that these guys are well trained. Having spoken with some guys that were down there, it was kind of hit and miss. Now, I'm not here to bash anybody. I'm not here to bash the jobs that the SFAB has done. And I'm also not here to bash the Afghan military. But there, is, there has been a consistent problem of green on blue attacks, meaning a green on blue attack is essentially a partner force that you might have. For example, if I was to have a partner force in Thailand and a Thailand soldier engaged a U.S. soldier and shot and killed them, that is a green on blue attack. A blue on blue attack would basically be between a U.S. soldier and a U.S. soldier. That's kind of what that terminology comes from. So there, is, there has been a problem of that, let alone the fact that there is still some aspects of corruption in there. So it's, it's a very long process. But this is something that we have invested, like I said at the beginning, like $2 trillion into the country of Afghanistan. And there are many out there that say we've seen nothing from this. And one of the reasons why is because we try sometimes to change people that don't want to be changed. There are people that are farmers, right? They, at one point, I remember that we had donated uh, uh, farm equipment to them, like a tractor. And the farmers didn't want these tractors, but we insisted, no, you take these tractors. And so what they would do then is they would just take the parts and sell them off to other people. But here's another problem that usually sometimes happens. Sometimes people make promises to tribal leaders that they cannot follow up with. Now, over that country, there's a huge cultural impact. If you make a promise to somebody and you don't follow through with that, it can gravely affect the rapport of your entire unit and the U.S. military. So that's why it's important for people to understand over there, word is bond. If you do not follow through with a promise of yours, they are not going to help you. They're not going to want to help you. This is something that we have got to make sure people understand. Now, as far as the Taliban, yes, the Taliban is very frightening. Why? Because they do terrible things to people. I've seen them execute people on video, and I've seen them use people as target practice to work on their combat effectiveness. But the Taliban is one of the most dedicated units out there because they rely heavily on ideology. They will sacrifice one person to hold an entire army unit just so the rest of the team can escape, just so the rest of their group can escape. They're disciplined, they're dedicated, and they have ideology to back them up. Now, should we be concerned about this? Well, I'd say Michael had a fairly good assessment about that. However, the only reason I am skeptical about this, I was skeptical about this when President Trump was going to do the pullout, and I'm somewhat skeptical about President Biden. But do I think it's kind of time for us to go? In a way, I do. Do I think that we might end up going back there? Well, we saw what happened in Iraq, but that was a different story. I honestly think that if we want to make sure that we don't go back, it's the Afghan military and the Afghan government has got to step up to the plate and take their country back and ensure the Taliban, because if they don't want Taliban to rule that country, the first thing they have to do is they have to gain the rapport and the respect of the village elders. And then that's how they're going to take back their country. It's their country. So that's my only assessment about that. So let's go ahead and open up the floor. 
So uh, oh, the Taliban are a, a much more complicated thing than, than ISIS or any of the Al Qaeda or any of these these uh, you know kind of groups we want to lump them in with. The Taliban are much more geographically located. So, for instance, ISIL they're in all, all over the place at the moment. Whereas Taliban, they are pretty much an Afghan only force. They might leak into you know Uzbekistan, Tajikistan's, even to a lesser extent Pakistan and, and Iran. But they are very much more geographically located than 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 other than other terrorist units. <laughs> even the Taliban don't have full you know don't have the full support of even Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Tajiks don't like them. The Northerners don't like them. Even some of the some of the lower Pashtuns won't like the Taliban at all. So I I don't think that they'll have the uh the capacity to go in and i think the farming thing is is a it's speaking to something that is quite a problem for them so farmers over there effectively were making a lot of money selling poppies uh which is the precursor to heroin Mm -hmm. and you can make a buttload of money on that Uh, when the u.s were giving them tractors it was to try and encourage them to farm other things uh, to which they went why would we bother you know working three times as hard when we can make you know, poppies that just grow naturally and we can sell it for four times as much and yep. not have to work hard at all. Uh, so that's, again, it's as much as we look at them going, well, they don't want the farm equipment. It's they don't want the farm. They don't want the farm equipment because that equipment would force them into uh, farming things that aren't heroin. Yep. Uh, and heroin is just such a lucrative trade, particularly with the Tajik smugglers run. Yep. Um, so it, it's a much more complicated situation on the ground than I think anyone's particularly ready for. And the other one I want to, you know, time, if, you know, everyone goes, well, why now? Well, I think you know, obviously the Biden wants to come in and show that he's got a bit of a different foreign policy agenda. He wants to get out of there. But at this point, his hand was already forced. Trump mm-hmm. had pulled out most of the, uh, of a lot of forces during his administration and had given a lot of concessions to the Taliban already. You know, Trump was hoping to have this done before the election. So he gutted what the US could do in the area um, already. So, you know, I'm not giving him credit for that. Effectively, he just was hoping to get the political concessions that came with it. Yep. Um, so by the time, it, the only way that Biden, if it literally only has two cards, one surge and push back in the country and try and take some area, which failed under the Obama administration, failed under the Trump administration, or pull out. And now seems as good a time as any, uh, but I still, the US presidents won't leave. There'll still be private militaries. There'll still be possibly some guys on the ground. There'll still be spec ops. Um, but the real trouble we're having here is under the Trump administration, they cut the program to uh, effectively translators or allies or friends or helpers of the US troops over there were guaranteed that they would get citizenship in the United States if they'd served and helped US yep. forces on the ground. Which there. is good. That that was agreeing. That was a fantastic program and it, it gave people going, look, if I help the US for five years, my family can go to the United States and we can get out of this. That program was cut under the Trump administration, uh, and all of these guys who had been helping the U.S. administration now have that in their head going, the U.S. is going to pull out. They're not going to save me. I need to prove that I am, you know, that I'm not a U.S. stooge and that the Taliban would be much more friendly to the Taliban. Uh, why would I be super helpful to the U.S.? And why not? Now's the time to signal that I'm friendly with the Taliban, particularly if you're in the Pashtun areas. Uh, anywhere near the Pakistan border in the south, particularly, that will be... Uh, very pertinent in your mind at the moment of course um so i think it's a much more complicated situation than even the us or anyone realizes at the moment Uh, and generalizing here is is very difficult because of the fact that the taliban are not even in control of all of afghanistan not even all of the taliban agrees and the worry here is right now of the six or seven major warlords and six or seven major factions in this in this conflict at the moment they all have the us to rally around and hate and, and fight and push towards without a US presence to unite a lot of these warlords and tribes, they may turn on each other. And that's the big fear is that they will effectively turn on each other for the power vacuum that will form. Uh, and if one side is losing and they go, well, I'm losing the war, I'm, you know, the, other, the, the Pashtuns are taking my territory. The quickest way to get money is to turn to radical forms uh, of funding. Because if you are the most radical, if you do the beheadings, if you do the real nasty stuff, uh, you tend to get more money from particularly wealthy Saudi donors. So they may go radical in to try and get money from groups like ISIS and, and Al-Qaeda in the hope that they don't lose the civil war and be taken by a rival tribe. That's what the fear is at the moment, that one of these guys turns radical, because right now I don't think any of the kind of six major warlords at the moment will be looking to go into international terrorism very much. It's just 
right now it's a geographical fight rather than an international one. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether that, you know, but if that war, civil war happens between the six of them, that's when we start having problems. And I think the US are not particularly prepared for that scenario. Uh, Ryan, you got anything? Um, I was going to, uh, I kind of lost my train of thought, but I was going to ask about um, what, uh, I, I, I heard something about the US having like a specific a deal that they'd struck with the Taliban, which I, that, that sentence kind of feels weird. Like what, what is, what is that, um, what does that consist of? And, and I know that I heard also that we had not like struck any sort of deal or we had a difficulty striking a deal with the Afghan government. So what, what is the, what can someone give me like a more robust, um, uh, like, like what, 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 what is that all of that about? So you want to take that, Alex, you want me to take it? Uh, so uh, I'll hand off to you in a second. So one of the deals from what I understand that was uh, struck with the Taliban was that, you know, if we kind of stay out of their way, they'll kind of stay out of our way, essentially. That's just kind of lamest terms. That's what I'd gathered from it. But the deal that we had struck with the Afghan government was the SVAB was supposed to be our exit strategy to build up the ANA forces and the uh, Afghan police to make them credible and reliable. That was that was like the point of our exit strategy because the president at the time, the president of Afghanistan, was on board with this idea because the purposes, like I said, of these advisors is to ensure that this is their only focus. They don't fight. They're not supposed to engage one-on-one, but they will if they have to. But their main focus is to give credibility and to ensure that this is the only thing they have to worry about. They can work more with the ANA, work with their leaders, work more with the tribal leaders. This is the whole, this was like the, the, the plan. This was supposed to get us out of Afghanistan. It's a very lengthy process to construct, to completely train up and to give credibility to a military unit of their own host country. While you're trying to basically like not make it seem like you're in charge, you're actually just there to kind of support them in their decision making. So that way it gives them more credibility. That way when you leave, They've already developed that rapport with the tribal leaders. They've already developed that rapport with their government. They've already developed that. That that was the whole point of it. And I think it's still a sound strategy, even if it, you know, it, the people would say, well, it didn't work in Afghanistan. Even if it doesn't work there, it's going to work in other places. I think that there are places where it actually did work in Afghanistan because I heard the success stories from units that went to Afghanistan. Did it work all the time? Probably not. But I, I think it's just. That that's more about like how did how successful was the mission? How was it that they were actually able to build that rapport? Was it successful? I mean, it, it, this is one of the things that you, you would have to kind of find out and look into. But this is something that I'm not privy to that information anymore. But that was our exit strategy. So go ahead, Mike. So effectively, the A, we we're not looking to rely completely on the ANA. The majority of that that deal that Trump and Biden has effectively made was between the U.S. and the Taliban, not between the Afghan government mm-hmm. and the Taliban, which is a big, you know, that's a big indication of the faith that the U.S. has in the uh, the Taliban has in the Afghan government. The idea was that the Taliban would be allowed to kind of retake the country and retake majority of the areas, but in exchange they would not harm the international terrorism, and that was the main part of that deal. To make sure that they wouldn't become the next caliphate in the area uh it's a lovely thought but i don't you know even when that deal was signed the deal was that to prove that the taliban had control of their areas that there would be no bombings for 90 days and that lasted four before there was another bombing so the taliban do not have firm control over their own territory and they're not as centralized command as we would like to think they are mm-hmm. even now faith in the ana is is already showing a lot of cracks a lot of the ANA and even the, the SFAB guys and all those guys are already running off to Tajikistan and we're already by the US purchases in the US what they're leaving behind is an indication of where the conflict is going so right now they're leaving behind a lot of armored vehicles and a lot of armored trucks because they're expecting this to become an archipelago so effectively you'll have little pockets of ANA and Afghan government control with no man's land in the middle so it means that supplying let's say running from uh, Kabul to Mazar Sharif, that is going to be an armored convoy that does that run because mm. the US will not be able to guarantee anything outside 20 Ks outside the center of the city. Um, the ANA won't guarantee anything outside the center of the city. Again, I think it's going to be this is the very same model we saw when the communists uh, left in the 80s is the fact that the central cities effectively maintained a communist government and had a commissars and were were operating fine and you could point to it and go look see there's a communist president of Kabul but his his authority does not extend much outside the major cities 
uh, and the Taliban are contesting most of those major, major uh, outside the major city areas and the desert areas, uh, particularly in the mountains as well. So I don't have particular faith that the a, that the ANA are ready to take the baton over, mm -hmm. uh, but by the weapons we're seeing left behind, by the deals that we're seeing left done, it's looking like the US are hoping it becomes an archipelago and that the Taliban stick to their word not to allow international terrorism to be fermented on their soil. Uh, but I don't have faith that the Taliban have that much control over their own troops anyway. No. What, you, what you got, Manny? Um, pretty much, uh, you guys have really uh, given a lot of information. I really do appreciate it. Um, but uh, I think that um, uh, to go back to what um, Michael had said before, um, I definitely think that there's a lot of civilians in uh, Afghanistan who don't want to be under Taliban rule. Um, you know, I've heard, you know, some of the horror stories that, you know, they've committed. And it, it you know, it, it's definitely not a good situation to be in, you know, when you're just a farmer trying to live a simple life and, you know, you have the U.S. on one side saying support us, but then you have the Taliban on the other side saying support us. And, you know, you're just trying to protect, provi provide and protect your family. Um, however, I do still I do still have to stand by my initial statements as far as I think it is time for us to start leaving. Um, I think we should definitely try to the the U.S. government needs to try to come up with a better solution as far as uh, a more permanent solution for what the uh, Afghan government should do and how they should move forward with handling the Taliban. Personally, yes, I would like the, tal the Taliban to go away. Unfortunately, you know, we don't live in a fairy tale land. Um, and so I think that situation is definitely going to be hard to come up with a solution, especially with so many uh, different actors involved, like you guys were saying, um, you have tribal leaders involved, you have uh, different major cities that are under certain controls, but then the areas outside of those cities are under different controls. Um, and so I just think that um, it's, it's, you know, it's very, it's very, it's very delicate. Um, and yeah, I just think that uh, there, there just needs to be a better solution uh, to be reached as far as us and the, uh, the Afghan government. So Justin Lawrence just made an interesting point. So I'm not sure if I should open this can of worms, but the Taliban traffics drugs to the U.S. and Europe. This kills two birds with one stone for them. They're able to destroy American families and fund their organization, which we all seen how much of a failure the war on drugs has actually been because we've been fighting against drug cartels in Mexico and South America, and they have still remained in power because of you know, the fact that it's hard to get these drugs. I mean, it's actually, I wouldn't say it's hard, but because of the fact that it's illegal, people are actually willing to pay to get them. Now, the, the Taliban, you know, they are in the, uh, the heroin industry, and heroin is what, where does it, as far as like heroin goes, where does heroin rank as far as drugs in the world, Michael? Quite big. Um, so opiates particularly are, are not only, you know, quite used by the, manuf uh, the uh, pharmaceutical industry. In mm -hmm. fact, quite a lot of the opiate problem actually comes from poppies made in Afghanistan. Yep. Uh, but also heroin is just generally used throughout Asia, uh, Asia, the Europe and the, and, uh, the Americans as well. Mm -hmm. So, but you got to realize that there's a bit of a, a problem that it, much like in Colombia, not a lot grows in Afghanistan. And even if they were to go to move to crops that they could possibly get done, uh, like wheat, like barley, like this kind of stuff. There's no infrastructure to get it to market. You know, when in Australia, for instance, our wheat fields are right next to train lines and the train lines can get it to ports and ports can get it out to the, the, the consumer markets. With Afghanistan, there's just no infrastructure to be able to do that. So any, any unless we are going to do what effectively we tried to do in Colombia, which is subsidize uh, Afghan plantations and Afghan crops, you know, in other words, have U.S. troops fly into these, you know, tiny little spits of, of farmland, pick up everything and pay 18 times the price. Nothing's going to happen because why would a farmer go through all the effort and water and fertilizer and everything they need to grow barley when poppy seed, poppies grow naturally uh, and people will pay very good money for it. Uh, and effectively, the smugglers highway between particularly the areas in the north heading into Tajikistan is such an established highway now that 
you know, with the, to try and sell barley would require them to work four times as hard, get it all there, get it to market, try and find someone to buy it, which towns may be miles away across different tribes where you're going to risk getting shot at the whole time. And even then you're landlocked. None of the nations around you are going to buy your stuff. So you've got to then make a deal with okay, Pakistan to get it out to market, which is just not feasible. Mm-hmm. Or you can sell poppies and a drug dealer will rock up at your house, gather the poppies and take it straight out to Tajikistan and give you the the money right there and then for it. Um, and poppies are very easy to grow in the Afghan soil. It's just a, a tidbit of Afghanistan. So as much as we can try and convince them, hey, grow something else, here's the tractors, we're willing to do everything. It's just not going to work. And we tried this strategy in Colombia and it was a dismal failure. Um, so... Yeah. Yeah, as much as I don't think they, they're doing it deliberately to break the US family. I think it's more just that's what they can grow. It's easy. It's nice. And rather than going through trying to sell it themselves, when you sell poppies, a guy rocks up at your farm and he'll collect them up and take them out himself. Manny, what what's your thoughts on that? So this actually hits into something that I'm very, uh, very, that I feel very strongly about, which is uh, drug legalization. Um, I do think uh, I am pro drug legalization. However, I do think drugs should be uh, regulated. And so for me, um, uh, Michael just brought up a good point about uh, the U.S. Now, I wouldn't probably recommend the U.S. government per se getting into the uh, buying poppies from farmers. Um, However, I think if we did legalize uh, drugs here, I think it would cut down on, at least in our country, uh, the flow from from Afghan heroin getting into our country. I think it would probably slow that down somewhat. Uh, I think maybe there could be uh, a beneficial private interest uh, from our country and uh, Afghanistan poppy growers. Um, obviously, I know, uh, you know, a lot of people when we say poppy, a lot of people immediately, you know, think, oh, heroin, heroin. But, you know, morphine comes from that plant. I believe codeine comes from that plant. Those are all medicines that are used in, you know, the hospitals and clinics all over the country. And so uh, I think if we focused on those benefits, that could be a solution to help uh, establish better relations between uh, Afghanistan and the United States. Um, you know, that's in, in that way, in, in my opinion, you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. You can handle drug problems here all while possibly helping establish rapport with native Afghan citizens to be like, Hey, you know, we're going to try to help do this, you know, but what is the Taliban doing? They're not doing anything. So that's just my take on that. What you got radical. Talk to me. Yeah. I was just going to add to that. Um, I, cause I was thinking something similar uh, about basically the, the, I mean, a lot of these things, uh, like with the poppies, um it feels like it's it's something that needs uh reorganizing of incentives um so like i guess like what um i guess i'm interested in exploring like what ways uh i I mean uh manny just uh discussed a few solutions um i I, like uh, i tend to advocate for decriminalizing most drugs um that seems to be a uh, something that would probably have a good effect but like what uh if what would what would that look like from us doing that, like, and all the way to, um, like, what's that chain look like from um, us doing that to the actual restructuring of these, uh, of those incentives in Afghanistan? Well, those are all very fair points, because I I am also realizing that the the war on drugs has been an epic failure. It's done absolutely nothing. As a matter of fact, with our country right now, we have the highest prison population per capita. And a lot of people are imprisoned for drug use. Now, granted, I'm a firm believer that if you're distributing the drugs and, for example, it's laced and they die from that, or, for example, if you get high and you kill somebody, then, yes, obviously you should go to prison for that. However, drug possession and you know usage is, to me, a different story. Now, I think if you're distributing it to your children, obviously you should treat it just like you do with alcohol and tobacco. Same, same concept. I just think that there's a lot more, like we can put more funding into rehabilitation centers to get people clean and sober, because just because you legalize drugs does not necessarily mean that everyone's just going to start doing drugs. It might increase, but that doesn't mean ever because, you know, alcohol is legal and there are a lot of people in this country that do not drink. There are a lot of people, you know, that don't smoke cigarettes or use tobacco. I'm one of those people. I'm a former tobacco user. I've been clean from tobacco since 2013. Yay me. But... 
I, I just look at it from a very practical standpoint. Is it really worth it to keep the uh, drug we're going, especially like it's such a hugely profitable industry? Now, there is always going to be a drawback to this. You can have the criticisms as to like allowing heroin on our streets. However, the heroin is already on the streets. It's just right now it's illegal at this point. And yes, we are funneling money into the people that are making a profit of this, especially the drug cartels, the Taliban, however you want to put it. Yes, we're funneling money into them. However, you know, even if the Taliban wasn't the main grower of heroin, somebody still is. So it's it's to me it's another one of those double edged sword arguments in my honest assessment. So so we actually tried doing this uh, a few years ago, or the US tried doing this a few years ago and buying up all the poppy fields to try and stop them smuggling the heroin and making giving it to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, what happened though is that the Taliban just started growing two crops. They just started rather than using this much land, you know, when they went, oh, well, that's all going to be bought by the US, they officially sold this much land, but they just doubled their production and sold to the US while still delivering the illegal heroin uh, down the smugglers' highway into Tajikistan and into the European markets. Um, so again, it, all it did was give the poppy farmers and the poppy manufacturers in Afghanistan far more power than they had going into this. So mm -hmm. again, I, I think it's a good idea, but we tried it, it failed. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very difficult thing to police. The only way you could possibly try this is by clamping down on the border uh, on Tajikistan. And that's something that the Russians are somewhat trying to do. The Chinese are somewhat trying to do, but the, the Americans are not getting involved in. And even if we would have managed to somehow keep Tajikistan closed, which is a very big if, if you understand Tajikistan, then they might just move to going through Iran or they might just move to going through Uzbekistan uh, and then into Kazakhstan and back into the European markets. Because once you're into Central Asia, it's very easy to transit between the, the five star nations these days. Um, so yeah, as, as much as I'm, I think it's a good idea, maybe that we could uh, try and get these guys into legitimate business. We have tried and it did fail much like it, we tried the same thing in Colombia and it failed there too. So, uh, one of the questions that was posed here, and I know you'd already addressed it earlier, Mike, was the, uh, issue about the use of armor and military equipment that has just kind of been strewn about the place. The mm -hmm. Taliban has taken full advantage of this, similar mm -hmm. to the times when ISIS and, or ISIL, whether it was in Syria or Iraq, they were able to take full advantage of the weapons that were left, the technology that we were, we had given the Iraq, Iraqi forces, the Syrian rebels, and the ANA forces. So this is something that I feel could be of a concern, not just for like the ANA, but also for the civilian populace, because now they're actually a little bit more armored up. So uh, we'll start with... Um, We'll start with uh, Radical. What's your thoughts about, like, uh, you know, the Taliban gaining, like, military equipment, uh, vehicles, stuff they didn't really have before? I mean, they've already had, but they, now they're acquiring more of it because it's being left behind. What are your thoughts about that? Um, uh, it's it's concerning. I I, I don't like, I, I don't love the idea. Uh, I, I I don't have, like, a, I don't know that I have a good a good answer for this one. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, uh, the consequences sound like they could be pretty not good for a lot of people so so mike do you think if once they uh have all these this equipment the taliban do you think they're gonna start flexing their muscles against uh other people not particularly the equipment they're gathering at the moment is mostly small arms uh ammunition a lot of the weapons you'll find in afghanistan particularly are pakistan made copies um which are they shoot you know, they are not very good. I'd be more worried about blowing my own fingers off than someone else is using a Pakistani made rifle at times. Um, the weapons they're getting are very small arms. They're good for patrols. They're good for, you know, just maintaining sort of what the Taliban are doing at the moment, but we can't, they're not going to have power projection, force projection, because it doesn't matter if you'll you have all the bullets in the world. If you don't have the fuel for the trucks, if you don't have trucks and replacement motors and logistical trains, there's no way Afghanistan's going to push in in legitimate ways into any of its neighboring countries, particularly as there's robust armies in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, well, Tajikistan less, but Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, and Pakistan is not going to go down that road. The Indians are supplying, will probably likely supply some replacement parts, but I don't think Afghanistan's going to have power projection outside of its own borders, apart from asynchronous warfare. And even then, that's already rife in Pakistan as we speak, uh, and Tajikistan, the Chinese and Russians are trying their best to, uh, to quell that as much as they can. 
Uh, the equipment they're gathering is small arms, armor, machine guns, uh, belt-fed weapons, uh, you know, the basic stuff. Um, they don't have air power. They don't have burst radio hoppers. They don't have uh, some of the stuff you really need to be able to do large-scale operations. So I'm not as worried about them pushing into other nations, but it is definitely hard, you know, if they've got all this budget free that they don't need to buy ammunition anymore, it does raise the question on what they now have the money to buy. Uh, who will sell to them? That's a whole other question. All right, Manny, what you got? What do you think about that? Um, personally, I think that whatever, I think the, uh, the, when the U.S. left, whatever equipment we had, like as far as armor or machine guns or whatever, whatever wasn't going specifically to the Afghan government, we should have either taken it back or we should have just destroyed it, whether it was a uh, up-armored Humvee or if it was a 240 machine gun. It should have either been taken or destroyed. Um, I, I, I do get the idea that, you know, all right, big deal. They got a couple of machine guns. They got some hand grenades, you know, and yeah, on the on the in the long term, it may not be a big deal. But on the short term, let's say they're trying to conquer. They want to take over another village. Well, to do that, you, all you might need is one or two heavy machine guns, and you're going to be able to walk in that village and you just wreck shop and be able to slowly build from there. Um, so, yeah, you may not be a threat to the, to the big cities or the bigger areas that actually have a professional army protecting it, but you may not want to go there just yet. You may just be fine taking up all the smaller areas that you can. Um, but that, that's just what I think. I definitely think... Um, anything that wasn't claimed by the government should have either been taken back or, uh, or destroyed. So, so yeah. they, they, oh, I was going to say they never had a chance to take anything back. Effectively what had happened is they'd supplied these weapons and armor and whatever they were giving to, you know, outposts of the ANA. And as the Taliban were approaching the majority of fights that we're seeing, uh, the Taliban approaches the outpost and the ANA just go, no, nah, I'm not fighting this. This is not worth dying for and they leave and they run out of town as quick as possible they grab whatever they can fit in the truck and they go um so the us never really had a chance to destroy it because these are most of the weapons that are being captured are being captured from abandoned ana posts not us posts some are you know when they're for instance they're leaving the air bases they're taking what they can and going but you know what's left behind is minimal if this is mostly ana stuff that's falling into taliban hands so when you look, okay when you think about it though when, when it comes down to occupying like vehicles, the Taliban, from what I understand, are going to stick to what they're used to. Why? Because it works. Um, if they think it's going to give them a significant advantage, then yes, they might take full advantage of it. But honestly, I, I think I'm with Mike on this, is that they just might sell it to somebody else and make a profit off of it. I'm sure they can find an interested party that'd be willing to purchase these, uh, um, you know, uh, what is it? Whether it's a military vehicle or if it's a certain weapon system that they just don't really care for, because the Taliban operates off of guerrilla tactics and it's working quite well for them. And I'm pretty sure that unless it's a weapon that they're willing to lug around for hours at a time, because I've done stuff like that before. I've tried carrying a saw during patrols that gets heavy after a while. And this is why I'm also wearing body armor at the same time. The Taliban, I haven't really seen them wear too much body armor, but they prefer to travel in light. They, they prefer to travel, like, yes, they'll have, like, an RPK machine gun, and but that's about as heavy as they'll get. Yes, they might have a mortar system, but mortars, systems that they use, or recordless rifle rounds that they use, are easy because they can just emplace them quickly, and then, boom, they launch them. So that's the way that the Taliban's been fighting, and it's been working quite well for them. And that's what kind of separates them from ISIS. Because ISIS, everybody likes to talk about how dangerous ISIS is. At the end of the day, I look at ISIS as they're only dangerous when they capture people. Because I've seen the uh, Kurdish Peshmerga wipe out entire ISIS units. And they do it pretty easily. Now, there are times like when the Kurds get overwhelmed. That's just because ISIS has such vast numbers. But the way I look at the Taliban, the Taliban is disciplined. They are far more disciplined than ISIS is. Because I've seen what happens when ISIS gets captured and these guys freak out the taliban isn't necessarily the same thing it's just it, they're a different breed of warrior when it comes down to that especially with an insurgent and i'm not saying i necessarily um you know uh, respect them but what i do respect is their capabilities because they are able to do things that most of us never would have thought of honestly and like i said i don't respect the taliban but i do respect the fact that they're willing to fight tooth and nail for every scrap of land that i'd seen from that 
And but like I said, I think they're just gonna stick with to what they're good with unless there's a reason why they should change their tactics. Depends on the enemy they have to fight next. So um here's one of my next questions. I brought up the very beginning that China was very critical about the us invading in Afghanistan, but now they are very worried about us pulling out from Afghanistan. So, Mike, I'm going to start with you. Why do you think China might be a little bit concerned about us pulling out from Afghanistan? So China right now, obviously, as we know, is having problems in the west of its country, uh, both in Tibet and Xinjiang. Uh, that's where they worry about terrorism. That's where, they, that's where their internal domestic security problems are. Now, effectively, if the, you know, if you speak to Russians, they all refer to Afghanistan as the swirling pit of doom. Um, which I think is a bit of an over-exaggeration, but whatever. Uh, and the worry is that if things destabilize in Afghanistan, it will spread to Tajikistan, and Tajikistan shares a border with China. The worry is that if terrorism and drugs and all the bad stuff gets out of Afghanistan, and it will flow into Western China. And if it rabble-rouses in Western China, then China has to clamp down even harder on, on the Uyghurs and, and all the communities out there. So China is desperate to keep the swirling pit of doom in Afghanistan. So... They haven't officially, they're not officially in Tajikistan, but they'll have border patrol posts is the nicest way I've ever heard bases called in my life. Um, they will run, they're running joint operations with the Russians as well as the Tajik government uh, and trying to make sure they can, you know, they know they can never close the smugglers highways uh, because there's frankly, it's such an inbuilt into the Tajik system. So most, when you're in Tajikistan, you usually pay about 30,000 US dollars to become a border post guard. Um, because it's such an inbuilt corruption that effectively you pay and you let in so you let drugs come through and you take a cut of it. So a lot of families will, or the whole street will gather money to send one person from that particular street to go be a border guard, who will then send the money back to the the people living in in Dushanbe or wherever they're living. China is wants to make sure that the drugs go straight up into you know Europe and Russia and you know Tajikistan into Kyrgyzstan but in Kazakhstan into Europe rather than going in here into China. Um, this is the main Chinese fear, is that the instability from the region will flow into the Muslim areas of China. Uh, effectively, all this is, is we would rather keep all the nonsense back in uh, Afghanistan and possibly Tajikistan than let it flow over the, uh, over the, over the Palmyas into China. Uh, yeah, that would be my assessment of the situation whether they be able, whether they can do it it's still a question i think the chinese and russians are working pretty well uh and to even get you know effectively if you look at tajikistan imagine it like a, a bit of a like a rabbit um uh, it kind of it looks like a bit of a rabbit with ears up here in the two main bits of tajikistan this area here in the palmiers there's only one to two depending on the season of, of the year roads between the west of the country where the majority of the population live and the east of the country which borders china uh, and I know my camera may be mirrored, so it may be confusing, but effectively, if China can keep these highways clear, uh, it'll mean that the Bandakshan areas of Tajikistan will not uh, have terrorism flow into them or any more than they already have, or that it will stay contained and not flow into China. So this is just China covering its own skin. Manny, what you got? Um, as far as China uh, getting involved with Afghanistan, I don't know too much about that. But um, based on what Michael said, um, based on the information he just gave, um, I mean, if they're cutting deals with the, Ch the Tajik government to try to stop, you know, whatever getting into their country, I mean, that's kind of that's that's kind of their own problem. Sure. In my opinion. <laughs> okay. Uh, Radical, what you got? Um, actually, it was funny. Right before you went into that topic, I was I had a note I was going to ask uh, for a, a more um, like a, a kind of a view, a more elaborate or elaboration on the the Chinese and Russian interests in in this. So um, I guess I I'm just I'm just curious if you want to like that was you gave a lot of uh, useful information there about like what's going on on the ground. Um, I, I guess what's a um, you you kind of summed it up at the end, but what what what's a I mean, again, because I'm really coming out this as a, as a layman who really doesn't know a lot about, like, the geopolitics of the region. Um, so, like, can you tell me more about, like, uh, like what the Russian interests are there and what the Chinese interests are there and, like, what incentives exist between them um, and what, what the consequences might be? I've heard a lot of people express concern about um, what China might do if the U.S. pulls out. 
um, or when the U.S. pulls out, rather, in this at this point. Um, so I guess I, I'm just looking to learn more about all of that. Do you want to say this one, Alex? You don't no, mean to take you, it. You, you got it. Okay, so China and Russia's interests are effectively making sure that swirling pit of doom doesn't get out. Uh, there will be some private interests, so you'll find Chinese rare earth firms may get involved. You find some Chinese money may get in there, and they might do some investments. Uh, but again, I think China's smart enough to know this is you know why put money in there when there's a good chance you might lose it afghanistan you know is very difficult to put investment into and china doesn't worry about the afghan border with china because it's very small and through the mountains what they worry about is tajikistan falling uh, because that will ver reverberate through the region now russia has always viewed tajikistan as the buffer state between uh, you know effectively the russian core interests in central asia and afghanistan so both of them are working quite closely with the Tajik government to keep that border as closed as they possibly can. Um, and obviously the other Central Asian partners. So Turkmenistan will also be very worried at the moment. So a lot of the border crossings at the moment that the, Af the Taliban have taken are on the Turkmen border. Uh, but the Turkmen border is so solid anyway, no one's getting in and out. The Uzbekistan has usually been the main entrance in. In fact, the the US came in, quite a lot of the tanks came in as well. The Russian tanks came in on the Uzbek Afghan Friendship Bridge. <laughs> I love that name. Um, so effectively, all these countries are just looking for a containment strategy to make sure that the problems of Afghanistan don't get out. Uh, there will be some private companies going in, but it will be a drop in the bucket. Uh, China will effectively pay off some people and pay off some warlords just to make sure that drugs don't go down certain roads or that they don't make sure they don't put any, any troops into Xinjiang. Um, but I don't think the interest from Russia and China extends far beyond keeping the lid on the whole situation. Okay. So one of my next questions here is, who do you think is the biggest winner and who do you think is the biggest loser when it comes down to the U.S. pulling out from Afghanistan? Um, Radical, why don't you go first? Um, I guess as I kind of alluded to in my opening, my I, my biggest concern or my fear is that the biggest losers are going to be the 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 Afghan people who don't want to live under uh, the what uh, Taliban's rule, which seems to be uh, pretty unpopular for uh, especially again women who who want to uh, educate themselves or work, um, which are which are things that ac across the globe we're we're still uh, making progress on, you know. Um, so seeing that go backwards is uh, just uh, kind of depressing, um, and I guess the the winners. Um, it, could potentially be uh, uh, that the same, the other side of that coin. Um, but yeah, that's just my brief, okay. yeah, those are really my feelings about it. Manny, what you got? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Who do you think is the biggest winner or the biggest loser? It could be a country, it could be a group, it could be a region. Who do you think is the biggest winner? Who do you think is the biggest loser with the US pulling out from Afghanistan? Uh, I think the biggest loser uh, I would have to agree with Radical on that one. Um, I definitely think it's going to come down to the the civilians of uh, Afghanistan, especially the ones living outside of the big cities who are at the mercy of uh, of the Taliban directly. Um, you know, it's easy for the, the government who's hiding behind military forces and professional soldiers to, you know, kind of run their mouth. It's a lot harder for, you know, the guy living in a shack in the middle of the woods with his family when the Taliban could just kick his door in and, you know, execute his whole family. Um, as far as the biggest winner, I honestly don't think there is going to be, uh, I don't think there is a winner in this situation. Uh, I don't think the U S won. I mean, we were there for oh so many years. We lost millions of dollars. Um, the Taliban has lost thousands of fighters they've lost money they've lost territory gained territory you know they're not i'm pretty sure they're not having fun with what's been going on in the last few years um obviously the afghan government isn't winning um i don't even uh you know pe some countries who we might consider adversarial such as china and russia as you guys just mentioned they're trying to keep everything contained so they're they can't win just because we withdrew you know they can't really rub it in our face because it's like well now that you're closer to it than we are so you kind of got to deal with any ramifications that could possibly arise so i really don't think there's any uh any winners in this situation okay 
Mike, what you got? So I think the, the situation again is, is far more complicated than uh, some you know winners and losers here. So there are some bits of the of Afghanistan who will be better off under the Taliban, particularly areas around Kandahar who have been the front lines for so long that markets get blown up. You know, U.S. forces get attacked. These guys that have you know were the front lines that are now under Taliban control are often reporting that things are more stable than they've been in decades, uh, because frankly there's no con contest. It's just this is the guy who rules. And the Taliban aren't kicking in doors and killing everyone. They, you know, they do some terrible things. But again, they're trying to win some hearts and minds here at the moment. It's why they're focusing quite a lot on dam control, paying bureaucrats, actually getting a system up and running, even though the bureaucracy doesn't really exist in a lot of Afghanistan. So some people will be winning from this. Other people who are against the Taliban will definitely lose from this. Um, you know, there could be if Afghanistan becomes much more stabilized. So even if it's under the Taliban. Uh, and it holds front, holds good. The winners will be India. India will love that because A, it will form a second front against Pakistan. Uh, and the Indians are very close with the Taliban and the Kabul government. Uh, it will also allow, there's been this dream in Indian politics for a long time, the Tappy pipeline, the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. That pipeline would supply India with enough natural gas from the Turkmen oil fields and gas fields that India would become energy effectively, have all the energy needs it has. So Turkmenistan right now has more gas than Qatar, more gas than Bahrain. It is a gas giant. But the only customer that they have at the moment is China because they can't go north into Russia because Russia has their own gas markets they want to continue, they keep solid. Iran has their own gas and they can't go south. They can only go to China at the moment. If Afghanistan stabilizes, they can then go to India and Pakistan and sell their gas there. Turkmenistan will be a huge winner on that one uh, because right now 85% of their market goes directly to China. The Indians would love to see a stable Afghanistan and they will try and do whatever they can. Now, what, you know, as much as we see ISIS as this terrible, terrible thing, when you actually speak to people on the ground and when you go into the areas around that area and speak to, you know, I've been to those areas, what you hear is, yes, ISIS was terrible and I didn't like the religious police, but it was the first time that power ran for 24 hours in years. Mm -hmm. uh, and we may see the Taliban give actual you know reasonable governance because the fighting will stop mm -hmm. you know it's not a coincidence that when taliban takes the area all the usually the bombings drop to zero because it's no longer a front line yeah you know the front line moves elsewhere so a lot of these people may find it a little more stable for once just to know you know do they have to wave an american flag when they see the troops and then at night when the americans go back to base do they have to wave a taliban flag now it's just okay i know who the ruler is i'm just going to stick with that let's go from there um so there's going to be winners and losers in all of this i think america is probably the biggest loser because it shows that the american you know can't beat their chest and win any war they get into and it will make the americans think twice before entering something like iran mm -hmm. um but again it's it really depends on on if you're a indian oil company this is a victory if you're a uh, a tajik living in in near kandahar this is a big a defeat for you i the way i look at it like who won i really wouldn't say there isn't a clear victor here simply because even if the u.s pulls out all the major forces and i know yes they're gonna leave probably some people behind as like envoys or emissaries or however you want to put it or security details th there will still be some manner of presence of a foreign government in there it does not just the united states but the reason why I say there's not even a real clear winner is because, like you said, there's going to be a huge power vacuum because now they're no longer aligned to fight against the U.S. military. Now they're going to try to find out who's the big dog. I kind of look at, like, there might be a resource or it might be an area, some, some real estate that maybe one tribal leader really, really wants or one warlord might want to take over. Well, now they're going to have to compete against each other. And then the, the Afghan government might have to, they'll, like, want the Afghan government to intercede or maybe the Taliban intercede. So really, I don't see too many winners here. Do, is it more of a perk that we are out of Afghanistan? Like that way we don't have to focus on the country. I would say that it's a good thing. I'd also say that the reason why the biggest loser, honestly, is, you know, first off, I think one of the biggest losers is the people, the people of Af the Afghan civilians. Why? Because they have to deal with these power struggles now, because for years they dealt with one specific power struggle. And then once we stepped in, they kind of had to worry about all these other different power struggles. They had to worry about 
warlords. They had to worry about the Taliban. They had to worry about NA. They had to worry about Afghan police. They had to worry about the U.S. They had to basically a lot of people to try to answer to and to keep good faith with. But at the end of the day, whoever they kept good faith with before, whoever their rival is, they are going to remember that. And they're going to try to make sure that they get paid in kind if they don't play ball, which is a very, very real threat that they're going to actually have to deal with. Um, some of the other people that are, I wouldn't say real big losers, but some of the people that have like really lost something was definitely us because we put so much into that country and a lot, the, the court of public opinion will say, yes, we did great things. But the overall consensus that I've seen is that people said we have not gained a single bit of ground over there. So I feel like in a way the U S citizen might feel like we are the biggest losers because they felt like we didn't accomplish much. And again, this isn't a stab towards anybody in particular. This is just what I've seen on social media. This is what I've seen in on the press. Everybody says, and a lot of these people will say, it's like, man, we should have gotten out of Afghanistan since a long time ago. The court of public opinion has a very drastic impact on those that serve. I would know because I've seen it. We've seen how people feel about this. And it has a drastic impact on how people might start questioning. It's like, why are we here? The people back home, they support us, but they don't support this campaign. So how can I support this campaign? It really kind of plays on your emotions, honestly. So at the end of the day, I still think the biggest losers right now is the Afghan civilians because they're the ones that have to deal with the fallout. But also, I would say that many of us that fought over in that country, that tried everything. And yes, there might be some stories people will bring up of like bad situations that troops might have done. But there was so much good that we tried to do over there. And some of them feel like it was for nothing. It, it's kind of like a uh, kind of a real screwed up scenario, honestly. But this is the, just the way I'm seeing it here. I mean, I, I really wouldn't say they're really, like I said, it isn't much of a winner. Um, so one of the last questions I'm going to ask before we get ready to close up. If there was any country that because the U.S. is pulling out, right? Do you think any of you all think that there is one country that might try to take full advantage of the situation that is not Afghanistan, that might take full advantage of us leaving Afghanistan. Uh, we'll start with you, Mike. There will be a few, uh, but for in very selfish reasons. As I said, India will likely take a large part in the Afghan politics going forward, uh, mostly because, you know, effectively there's this, the Pashtuns make a large chunk of Afghanistan. And there's a, this concept known as United Pushtanistan, which effectively encompasses half of Pakistan and about half of Afghanistan. If the Pashtuns become stronger and, and more virile, that will cause problems with Pakistan. And Pakistan will have to divert half their forces to quell problems in Pashtunistan. There is a good you know, push in India to try and form this second front against Pakistan. So they have to split their forces and put more pressure on Islamabad. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as the fact that there is the Tappy pipeline that will be a possibility. Because right now investors are like, Yep, we love the Pakistan bit of that. We love the India bit of that. We love the Tajik, the Turkmenistan bit, but we can't guarantee anything in Afghanistan. Iran will likely get involved as well, but mostly to secure their own borders and make sure. So in the southeast corner of Iran is Baluchistan. Uh, and the Baluch people do not particularly like the Tehran government. And they will make sure that the terrorism and arms and guns and, and fighters don't flow from Afghanistan to Baluchistan. So they will get involved, but to make sure the borders stay, the swirling pit of doom doesn't get outside that. Uh, we will likely see Central Asian countries. So already the Uzbeks are getting quite invested into into, into Afghanistan. Uh, and that's because there are a lot of Uzbeks living in Afghanistan. Um, so they'll try to do some business. They'll try to set up envoys. They'll try to be much more involved. Uh, and it's good. I think the Uzbeks, particularly in the Mraziwiyev, are a good player to be getting involved in this region. Um, I don't think anyone's going to get very involved in the internals. We may see Pakistan tried. Pakistan's always tried to have a lot of influence on Afghanistan politics, but a, quite a lot to counter Indian as well. Uh, Saudi Arabia will likely put uh, some money in there and favor particular warlords who may be closer to the uh, Saudi agenda. Uh, Turkey is likely is making huge invoice in, uh, into that region. So we likely will see Turkey supply I wouldn't be surprised to see surveillance drones or some uh, infrastructure and bureaucracy help um, to the Afghan people. And that's not unusual. The, Turkey, the Turkish are trying for that doctrine at the moment. Um, but again, it's, I don't think anyone wants to touch it until they can see what Afghanistan is. If Afghanistan 
forms into this effectively seven way mosaic at the moment where it's the Kabul, the actual Kabul and the archipelago of large cities become effectively a diet Pakistan situation. And the rest of it just falls to warlords and the warlords don't actually, you know, attack each other. That actually may be the best case scenario. Effectively, they can go, well, let's pay these six warlords enough that they just, you know, we effectively give them a map and say, you own everything in the red, everything else to stay away from and we'll keep the checks running if you do that. If that case, yes, the country may become stabilized enough to build pipelines, to build rare earth mines, to build mining infrastructure in there that it can become a, not a successful nation, but a, a better nation than when we walked in. Um, particularly if we, you know, let's say get some of the Northern Alliance tribes together and, and do form some of these uh, coalitions. This is all too far looking into the future in Afghanistan, things can change on a dime. Um, but I would like to think, you know, I'm a positive, I'm an optimistic guy that something will, will happen. Uh, but I don't think anyone wants to put their fingerprints fully on this train until they can see which direction it's gone. I was the only reason I was asking that question was because you did a, did a show on your podcast, uh, the Red Line podcast, talking about rare earth. And that was one of the reasons I brought that up because, you know, from what I understand, there's still a lot of lithium that can be found in Afghanistan. It's very rich in it, isn't it? Yes, there's a lot of rare earths and lithium and, and diamonds and everything you could possibly need in Afghanistan. But again, it's that poppy problem again of where the lithium and whatnot is, is in contested territory. It's very difficult to get out. So mm. it doesn't, even if you dig it out of the ground and you have this big pile of really nice quality lithium, how do you get it to port? Mm. Uh, how do you get it to the, the wider markets? Because A, the roads are not secure. It's why they're putting in a bunch of armored cars at the moment. So any of your trucks can be attacked. Uh, and B, you've got to then put it into Uzbekistan and then into what? Kazakhstan and out to the ports from and then to Russia and then you rely on Russia you try to tuck it into uh, Pakistan that's not a viable option either you try to go into Iran you can't the sanctions are in place um, you know there's no way of getting all this to port apart from through Tajikistan into China maybe and even then the power meters and the, uh, the infrastructure is terrible so the only market for this stuff would be uh, Afghanistan Tajikistan Kyrgyzstan into China mm -hmm. uh, possibly Kazakhstan as well the so I, I don't see it being a huge part of the market because why go through all that effort to get it from Afghanistan when there are other mines in China and Australia and Malaysia and all these sort of places that can, for the most part, get what you need without the hassle of dealing with uh, with Afghan politics. But the biggest one is most of these ventures will either require the Chinese to get involved, which they don't they don't want to. They're already busy with their own stuff, or private money. And if I'm an investor. You know, you come to see me and say, Michael, I want to borrow $1 billion to set up a rare earth mine in Northern Afghanistan. I'm not giving you that money because I cannot guarantee that investment will be there in 10 years. Yep. Um, it, it's just too unstable at the moment. So yep. they will find very little people willing to go in. There was talk of Eric Prince, you know, he was like, oh, we'll make a Viceroy and I'll mine it and that's how I'll make our money. But as soon as everyone asked him, okay, how do you get it to the port? He went, I don't know. And this yeah. is the problem that Afghanistan is not only hurt by its landlocked and its neighbors, but the fact that it's just too unstable for any private investment to come in and actually get the country, the jobs and the stability and the markets that they really probably need to become a successful flourishing nation. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that's one of the reasons I was wanting to bring that up. Uh, Radical, what you got? Um, that was, that was a lot to take in. I was uh, curious <laughs> about, I mean, I, I, I've, I've I see a lot of like the discourse online. I, I heard a lot of people express, like I mentioned, concern about the about China uh, sweeping in. Doesn't seem like uh, Michael's as worried about that. Um, that they're less likely. It seems like the the instability is probably a, a good deterrent right now um, from a lot of uh, any like strategic plans from uh, adversaries or but but also on the other hand, allies as well. Um, so I, I guess one of the things I was thinking about, um, wondering about is uh, you mentioned we, that they're still getting uh, like air support from the US. Uh, like what other support um, are we uh, expected to, to offer out there? And uh, what, what other, like, like one of the things that I like to see more and more of is like diplomatic resolutions to things. So like, what are like uh, the US and, and our allies capable of like, um, uh through through trade and whatnot uh or uh, other agreements that exist like 
what are ways that uh, that arms can be twisted in ways or, in, or or arms shouldn't be twisted even uh, in 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 the region. I guess that, those are my yeah so, thoughts about that. So for starters, when it comes down to negotiating, that it was a book I'd read a while back. It was called Getting More. It's about a guy that actually teaches this class about negotiation. And when it comes down to negotiating, if only one person's getting what they want, that's not negotiating. It's what both people get at the end of the day that benefits both parties. So, it, and it works whether you're a corporate executive or you're working with somebody that's doing uh, uh, key leader engagements with a village elder. It's all about like, how is it you're going to appeal to their interest that's going to benefit you in the future? So that's one way, and how you can usually do that is like, you have to know who you're dealing with. You have to know which village elder you're talking to. You have to know everything about them. You have to know the government official. You have to know their families. You have to know like, what is it that really makes them tick? Because if you don't take the time to learn this stuff and just expect them to just accept money, you know, you're not really going to get very far because they're just going to spend it however the hell they want to. There has to be a certain level of rapport that you build with them. And let alone the fact that you also have to make sure that when you're building this rapport and to make sure that you're also still making sure you, they get what they want and you get what you want at the end of the day. That's how you strike at their, um, their, their inner core because that's what is going to make your uh, um, business deal whatever you might make with them work for you because then it's going to build a side of trust between the two parties. I mean, that's just what I'm gathering from this. Now, how you go about doing that again, it comes to bound about knowing your audience, knowing who you're dealing with. And I feel there's a lot of times where people just don't know their audience enough. They just take a stab in the dark. It's like, well, it worked with this person. So therefore it's going to work with this person. You can't do it like that. You actually have to know the person you're talking with. You have to know everything about them. And it's just, it's so important that people just take that into account. So how does he get about that? It's just, at the end of the day, it's just knowing how to negotiate with them, whether it's a, you know, an emissary or a, an elected official or just even a soldier. Knowing these things, knowing these key factors into dealing with them is the best factor. What do you got, Mike? So effectively, the best model we have to look at and what negotiations will be like going forward would be Yemen at the moment. So if you're not aware, Yemen is, is kind of broken into a bit of a, a six-way civil war as well uh, with government forces and UAE-backed forces and, Houthi, and Iranian-backed Houthi forces and ISIS and just warlords chucked in to you know, spice it up a bit. So effectively, what will likely happen is the US to, with support, you know, again, the government only collapsed when the Soviets left after the money dried up. They will likely give money to the preferred warlords um, to keep them well supplied and effectively it will become a Afghanistan will effectively probably have about seven presidents and it will be hey you want to make a deal near Kandahar you speak to this particular warlord and he'll get that done if you want to make a deal in Kabul you speak to the Kabul government if you wanted to make a deal in you know uh, up in the Bandakshan areas you want to speak to you know this warlord and they'll likely pay each warlord and, and give support as, as they are the main US support will probably be to whoever is in control of Kabul because that will be the official representation for the US public. Uh, obviously, I don't expect the majority of the US public to be aware of which warlord controls what. Uh, US foreign policy is not a particular thing for the US domestic market. So, you know, the US will likely provide air support, you know, logistical support, intelligence support to the Afghan government. Um, so that if, let's say, there was a big push from the Taliban to try and take Kabul, they can bomb the absolute bejesus out of them as they come up the come up the highways. I don't think they'll want to do that. I don't think they need to do that at this point. But effectively, it'll be just sprinkling enough money on your preferred warlords so they become, you know, this warlord becomes the guy who's in control of Herat and the surrounds. And then you do anything to do with Herat and the surrounds is this particular warlord and he makes the deals and he's the guy you work with. Uh, diplomatically, you know, the guy that goes to, goes to the UN will be probably the guy who's in control of Kabul. Uh, whether that's Ashraf Ghani going forward is still yet to be seen. I think it probably will be um, because that way the US can point it and go, look, see, you know, we came in and it was the Taliban. And now look, this is the president of Afghanistan. He's not Taliban, he's Ashraf Ghani. And that's the problem that effectively he's, he will run an, he'll run an archipelago of cities. Um, the Taliban will, I, my guess is have one flag but it will devolve into much localized uh, control zones, much like it did back when the Taliban ran things before our invasion in 2001. You know, as much as the Taliban could wave the flag in Kabul, they had very little control over areas south of Harat uh, and around Mazar al-Sharif. Um, that is where I'd imagine the diplomatic 
will, ways will go. It'll become seven negotiations. As for US support with air, air support, that'll be to stop this any power balance. Effectively going, look, these are, you know, here is your boxes drawn for you. You know, this is, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. A, this is your area. If you attack this guy and try and expand your area, we will provide air support to these guys. Uh, and this is a situation that France has used quite well in, in the Maghreb and the Sahel saying, you know, they'll have two tribes owning bits of Mali and they'll say, if either of you attacks the other, we will support the other one until white peace happens, which is just, it goes back to normal. So that may be, that'd be imagining that me might be the solution for the US is just draw boxes and allow each one of them to own the territory they own. Um, but diplomatically, it's going to be a very complicated situation. It'll be a, what is on paper and what is real are two very different things. All right, Manny, uh, who do you think like would take full advantage of the situation now that the U.S. is pulling out of Afghanistan? Um, well, this kind of goes back to uh, me not being a professional on foreign matters. Mm -hmm. So to be completely honest, I am not sure who who's going to want to inherit inherit this very unique situation. And that's fair. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't think there's any one country that comes to mind that's going to take full advantage of this. I think it's because the entire world has been watching us for 20 years and how we operate in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and other countries. They are going to, they've been paying very, very close attention. I think the people that have been paying the closest attention, honestly, is China. And the reason why I say this is because China, China has been in this realm before. I think China, when it comes down to it, they, they, they focus a lot on what everybody else is doing. And I think they've paid very close attention to us. And I think that's why they are so concerned and I think it's just because, you know, Mike said earlier, it's because they're going to, the, the Taliban or whoever's in charge is going to start smuggling the drugs up into uh, Tajikistan, I think you were saying? Yes. Yeah. And I think it's just because China, they're going, to, if they were ever to take advantage of a situation like this in Afghanistan, they would have to, I think with President Xi Jinping, he would have to know what how it's going to benefit him in the long run. I don't think they're going to try to do an invasion of Afghanistan. I don't think any country is going to try to do this. I think each and every country in the surrounding area or a country that might have ties to Afghanistan or going to try to reach out to a certain warlord and see what piece of the pie they can benefit from this. So it could be any number of countries, which countries I honestly couldn't tell you. But I do think there are going to be some countries out there that are going to try to take full advantage of the situation because we're not going to be such heavy hitters in that country. And these warlords or the Taliban or whatever big power players you have in Afghanistan, they're going to want to seek outside assistance from a different country. I mean, they would be foolish not to. And yes, we're still going to have a little piece of it, but I think they're going to want to seek help elsewhere, honestly. Why? Because they're going to go with the country or the political leader or the party or the terrorist organization that's going to benefit them the most. I mean, that's just my personal assessment from this. So. Um, all right, so before we actually going to go ahead and close up shop, uh, first off, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, I want to go ahead and give everybody a chance to kind of give their final thoughts on uh, the pullout of Afghanistan. Let me know how you feel, good, bad, ugly, what have you, um, after this panel. Uh, Radical, kick us off. Sure. Um, so at, uh, ultimately, I, I still, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's a, any, like any, there's obviously no good answers. Um, we we kind of have where it's it really is like a rock and a hard place situation um and uh it, it i obviously i want to see like uh u.s troops come home mm -hmm. um as much as possible um so that's that's definitely a good thing they my my concern a lot of which again is for the people there who have to deal with the consequences that's just um well, so i'm interested in learning more about that still um I, I mean, I was gonna, um, I mean, this is something maybe we can get into another day or something, but I, I was gonna ask about like how the, cause there's been an entire generation that's like been raised since um, we've been there. Um, and I, I, when, I was curious about like what, what that generation kind of feels about the situation or like where they see themselves in it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, these, these are just my final, like, I guess, open questions at the end of, end of it. Um, uh, we talked. You talked about the differences between um, how, how uh, distinct like the Taliban is compared to organizations like ISIS and ISIL, um, and so. I, but I, I, one of the things I'd heard discussed um, was uh, how effective uh, the propaganda is of like them basically saying, "Oh, we we push. Look at us. We push the U.S. out." Um, 
and and how like whether that is like an unaffected I, I whether that is effective at like recruiting people around um to their side of things um and whether that's i mean all, all the, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing even if the stability itself um protects more people from a worse fate um then maybe that's ultimately a good thing um yeah that's um i I'll, i guess I'll, I'll leave it at that um all right yeah all right, hey, uh, let them know where they can, where people can find you oh, on yeah. social media, and uh, tell them about the panel you're going to be taking. Or you got a panel coming up, don't you? Um, I oh I, do I, have, I don't think I have another one okay. coming up just yet, but I, I am setting up a, a critical race theory debate on there you go. That's, vote. That's so nice. I think that that's going to happen sometime in the next couple of weeks. Um, but uh, for updates about that, you can find me on Twitter as Radical Coder. Uh, I'm on I stream on Twitch, uh, not very frequently, but I'm hoping to start doing that more and more. Um, I'm also a radical coder there. I'm, I'm pretty much if you search radical coder, you'll find me all over the place. Um, and uh, my website is radical.codes. It's pretty bare bones, but you can find like all of my links there. So Fantastic. thank you. Thank you again for having me. This was very educational. I'm probably going to listen back through. <laughs> there you go. All right, Manny, take us through it. Um, so yeah, uh, kind of going back to one of my initial statements. Uh, personally, I am glad that we're going to be uh, pulling out of Afghanistan. Um, we've been there for a really long time. I understand, you know, after 9-11, uh, things were definitely very heated in our country. Um, I think there was definitely, you know, there was definitely a cry for bloodshed. Um, however, as the years have went on, I think me and uh, millions of other people in the country are kind of just kind of just sick of uh, everything that's going on over there, especially with the sacrifices that um, the mil our military members have been making. Um, and to say all that, I, I do feel for the peop the normal civilians in Afghanistan because I understand, uh, like I said before, they're gonna be the ones that have to deal with, you know, uh, a government on one side, but then a terrorist organization on the other side. Um, and I hope somehow, some way there is a so a better solution to where they don't have to suffer mm -hmm. um but overall uh i have to i, I have to kind of look at our government our government and you know we we have enough problems here that we need to i truly do think we need to work on before we can start trying to uh fix projects all, all the way across the world okay uh let people know where they can find you or um social media whatnot if they want to engage with you further Oh, no problem. Um, if anyone wants to try to find me, uh, you can find me over on Discord at uh, Manny to the Max. I'm usually in the uh, politically provoked Discord a lot. Um, you can find me over there if you join that Discord. Uh, and that's uh, pretty much it. All right. Michael, take us away. I, I think it was the right thing to do. At this point, there's not a lot of options. Staying in Afghanistan, we were already losing oodles of territory the trump administration stopped uh stopped even counting the amount of territory they were losing because it was just the reports were looking so bad so there was no other option but a pull out by the time biden had taken the reins and again i think he's looking particularly you know like obama when he came into power is looking for a very domestic agenda before he starts worrying too much about the foreign policy i mean obviously <laughs> blinken's flying around like a madman at the moment but the domestic agenda is taking precedence at the moment it was probably the right thing to do. I mean, I think if they pay the right people, if they support the right ideologies, if they, you know, keep the money flowing, maybe we can keep the lid on this thing, much like the Soviets did at the end of uh, their occupation. Um, that would be the best hope I have. And I do hope for a stable Afghanistan. You know, if we can get it to where it's a decentralized nation and effectively becomes what would loosely be called in Western terms a confederation, um, we may be able to see a better Afghanistan. If they can get pipelines going through and get the royalties from that, if they can get some mines and, and foreign investment, then yes, we might see a flourishing Afghanistan. It won't be fantastic, but it may be somewhere the kin of, you know, uh, off the top of my head, somewhere maybe like Yemen before the war. <laughs> Which, yeah. If that's the best option, I think, um, yeah. I think it was the right thing to do and there was no other option on the table so I, I do wish them the luck i think we've spent a lot of money um and the next six six to eight months will be crucial to see the 
path forward for Afghanistan. So uh, go ahead and let everybody know where they can find you and tell them a little about the podcast that you do. So you can find me on Twitter at Mike Elliott Oz. Uh, you can find the Oxus Society, which is the society I work for for Central Asia analysis. Uh, but my main thing is the Red Line. So we're a podcast that does a big deep dive, big geopolitical deep dive each fortnight with guests from the White House, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, you know, all these, you know, big names coming in to talk about one subject, whether it be, you know, the Libyan Civil War or Afghanistan or the diamond trade in Africa. Uh, and you can find that on most major podcast platforms as the Red Line Pod. Uh, otherwise, you can find us on Discord and Twitter and Reddit and all the good stuff uh, where myself and team and my team are doing some uh, great analysis on lots of conflicts around the world. So if you're after geopolitical analysis, you can follow me on that. Uh, otherwise, um, yeah, thanks again for having me on the show, Alex. Alex is a, a good close friend of mine and in a, always very happy to help out in any project he's a part of. He's a great guy. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's... Yeah, that, that, that diamond conflict episode is like, folks, you got to check out that one because that will really kind of open your eyes about the diamond trade, honestly. So um, my final thoughts essentially is, you know, I, I definitely say it was high time. There's a lot of people that have suffered from this, you know, both on both sides of the conflict. And honestly, I just say that, yes, it was time to go. People did their parts, but they were going to wonder, was it really worth it in the end? And honestly, that's a question that's never going to be answered because war is absolute hell. War is a terrible thing. War should be an absolute last resort. But at the end of the day, conflict is just a part of human nature, honestly. Because at the end of the day, there's always going to be one power that feels that it has the ability to override other people. And then you've got people like the United States or Australia or members of the UN that say, no, we've got to put to stop to this. People are going to argue saying how the U.S. should not be the world police. Well, that's another topic we can possibly have at another time. However, at the end of the day, when you look at this, the people that are on the other side of war, for example, like I said, the Afghan citizens, they're the ones that are going to face the brunt of the attacks, and they're the ones that are going to have to deal with the fallout once we leave. We're going to come back. The soldiers are going to come back home, and they're going to continue on with their lives, and they're going to train and fight to fight the next war, essentially. But one thing I'm really glad to see is that the Biden administration, and I think this is a big plus, regardless of what administration does this, is making sure that the people that sacrifice their freedoms, that sacrifice their liberties and put their lives on the line, as well as their families, are going to get the help that they need. Because honestly, I feel they deserve it. They put their lives on the line for us. They put their lives on the line for the U.S. troops or whatever coalition force they might have. And honestly, they should definitely be rewarded for this. They should be well taken care of. Because honestly, for those that have never actually had to work with an interpreter or a contractor that made your mission successful, honestly, there are times where having an interpreter is what can really separate what can make a you know, key leader engagement or a negotiation between yourself, an elected official, or a village elder either function or just go straight down the toilet. This is why it's so important that if they take care of you, You've got to do your part to take care of them. At the end of the day, this is a move that was going to be made eventually. It was only just a matter of time. Honestly, I still have some apprehension from it, only because I worry about what's going to happen in the future. But at the end of the day, I'm glad that the soldiers are going to be coming home. 20 years is a long time. That's, like I said, I just retired from the Army, and I pretty much, Afghanistan has been a war as long as I served in the military. So it's high time that they did come home so uh gentlemen i want to take the time to thank you so very much for uh tuning in uh just hang around real quick after we're done and thanks a lot everybody for tuning in tonight but don't forget to hit like share and leave a comment and also be sure to spread this on to many different podcasts gentlemen thank you very much thank you for having me